Welcome to chapter nine. This is where the marketing mix, the extension of the marketing mix to incorporate the idea of people comes into a two part. It comes into the idea of the customer facing employee uh, and the customers themselves. So this chapter is all about the staff who are involved in the delivery of the service. Consequence of which is that you are going to see some degree of overlap between human resource management, management theory, and marketing here. But ultimately the key comes down to is in marketing, there is a framework, the service profit chain. And way back at the start here is the concept of the employee satisfaction. And this effectively is that if the employee is not satisfied, the chance of making a profit in a service delivery arrangement is greatly reduced. Now there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can point to um, where the superstructure, uh, superstar firms are making profits and their employees definitely aren't happy. But there are only one or two case examples of those, and there are well more case examples of the chronic failure of an organization because employee satisfaction, which leads to employee retention and employee productivity, was neglected in favor of some other facet. Because at the end of the day, if you are a skills-based service, if the value of your service comes from the ability of a person to deliver their skill set onto an object or other person, then you will need good employees and your employees are going to want to, you're going to want your employees to want to be at work. You're going to want your employees to be satisfied. You will be seeing the success through having good employee satisfaction levels. So one of the mission critical things here is that even if you just want to be completely inhumane, just absolutely arbitrarily a complete logic only, no, none of this kindness, niceness nonsense. You wouldn't run a factory with broken machines. You wouldn't run a factory with malfunctioning equipment. You wouldn't run a factory with poor quality resource inputs and expect high quality resource outputs. So you wouldn't do the same with your employees. So on the being a decent person side, you want satisfied employees on being an indecent person who just wants the maximum profits, you still want satisfied employees? That's, that's how it's gonna go? Because one of the keys is that a good employee and an employee who is committed to the firm is going to improve the likelihoods of customer satisfaction, particularly because we're going to see a connection between the employee's ability. So we look at here, customer service links back to satisfaction, but also links back to the internal service quality of giving your staff the ability to get the job done, the skills required to deliver, the resources required to meet the needs of the customers. All these internal processes come down the line to create a service value concept, a value offering that if the customer goes for, you're in business. If the customer doesn't go for it, you're soon to be out of business. So ultimately, customer loyalty comes from customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction comes from service delivery, and that's influenced by satisfaction, retention, and productivity. Happy staff who, could, who stay and can do their job well create better value. So a couple of the things in this, uh, we have the concept of the boundary spanner concept. This one's quite useful as a framework to consider because boundary spanners are the link between the internal processes of the organization and the outside world. So in part, these can be salespeople, these can be roles, uh, service delivery roles that supplement and complement physical goods, or they can be the product in themselves in, the, uh, in their own right. So really what you are looking for here is with the staff member, who engages with the outside world, engages with the customer, the clients, or, the, or uh, stakeholders, how 
does that engagement influence the way that we run our organization and the benefits we can get from their interaction? So a couple of things on the boundary spanning role. If you've ever worked in service delivery, you have experienced some of these. Uh, the person role conflict is a huge one where in particular, if you've got staff who have joined your firm in one capacity and then you promote, either promote them out of that capacity or transfer them across to a different area, uh, the number of people who have no inherent sales skill, who get put into sales roles, uh, who don't have the personality type that suits these sorts of engagements. And similarly, if you are gregarious and extroverted, the idea of being put into a service environment where you are the backstage and were never seen would be as challenging to that individual as chucking the introvert out and saying, go recruit clients. So find the right fit between your person, their personality traits and their role, Think about your service scape uh, and your service scape design in terms of approach avoidance. Think about your seduction model in terms of is the employee the kind of person who will interact well with our customers and our other, um, both our prime customers and the other customers. You also have the conflict elements of where you have the inter-client, the customer and other customers are in conflict and this results in uh, role stress for the boundary spanners because they are needing to balance the needs of the organization. You want both client groups, the needs of the clients, one group doesn't want the other group, vice versa, and trying to resolve that. And the final element is as the front line of the staff, you frontline staff, you bear the burden of what the organization does. You are the embodiment of the organization. And may I suggest that if your organization is committing acts of evil, change jobs. Get away from it. Don't expect people to roll over nicely um, and say, well, you're just following orders, because that's a terrible thing to do. There are times to break the rules. Now, a couple of things. Um, I want to basically flag this and point this back to the textbook. But the key thing is, if you identify that coping strategies are in place and that your staff are working in a manner that's contrary, that they're doing locus of control um, events, they're doing, they're avoiding the customer, they're merely processing rather than dealing with the customer as an individual, look to the cause of the problem, not the symptoms that are obvious. These are symptoms, they are not the problem. Go find the problem. Run your service analysis, run your blueprint, go back, look to see, look for role clash, look for the problem that is being highlighted by the presence of the coping strategy. Now, if we're gonna make uh, services marketing work, we are going to be interdisciplinary. We're going to draw on HR, we're going to draw on management. And there's a couple of theories we wanna talk about. We want to talk about the services HR wheel. Basically, the idea is right down in the center. A service exists because people do it. So to make that work, your service provider needs to have the right people. You as a service employee need to have the right balance of skills, abilities, and other facets. When it is a work-based environment, you are looking at what can we do to reward, evaluate, and control um, employee outcomes? And particularly control in the sense of if we are aiming for consistency, how do we enable consistency? If we're aiming for customization, how do we create an environment that supports customization? Around that, you will see that we have retention, recruitment, and training. No one comes to their role fully formed. You are always going to want to customize your employee to best fit your client and your service product. So even if you're trying to do the most cost cutting approach, training is customization. Customize your employee to get the most uh, benefit out of them for your firm. Or in other words, retain them, recruit them, recruit them, get the right people, keep them, 
train them to be better at being the right people. Do better. Uh, service, again, uh, one of the things on the service excellence, I want to briefly talk about the uh, reward system before moving down to talk about empowerment. Basically, if you're going to have a, a reward, it needs to have a, there are a certain set of criteria and traits that needs to go with it. Uh, but one of the biggest ones is, if you think about this from the perspective of a, a reward is designed to motivate, it must have a level of visibility so that others can see there is a point to pursuing it. And there must be a level of timeliness that it's got to be able to be connected between the positive act and the outcome. So coming into the empowerment, uh, there is a difference here between empowerment and enfranchisement. The empowerment is giving the trust to the organization's frontline and letting them do their jobs on the assumption that you have put in the requisite infrastructure behind it in terms of training, recruiting the right people, having a service design, having a clear service expectations, standards expectations. All of those elements are precursors to the empowerment. And the enfranchising is team up the ability to reward people for getting the job you desire done so that you increase accountability, but you also increase the correlation between do the job, see an outcome. So the last uh, aspect here is to invoke another one of our continuums. Uh, basically, this is where we talked about the idea of using consistency and inconsistency as ends of the spectrum. Inconsistency evokes involvement. High involvement, job involvement, suggestion involvement. Basically, the more you want it to be inconsistent, the more you're going to need to rely on that. Consistency evokes production orientation. So the production line approach, everything's standardized, nothing can be varied. The reality is a good service firm will sit somewhere in the middle. There will be certain levels of consistency, frameworks and structures to make life easier for your employees. Or even on the production line, if you're going to do it well, you're going to be open to feedback from the people who are engaging close quarters, experience-based market research with your, with your customers. Now, the high involvement aspect, uh, one of the things that you want to really look at here in terms of empowerment is that self-management, self-starting, self-rewarding means that if you've got the right people in place and you've worked your service HR wheel correctly, so you've got the right recruitment strategy, you're keeping those right people, you're getting them the skills they need, then they are able to run the service, to work with the service, and that leads us back to, if this element's right, it's gonna make it a lot easier to create the customer satisfaction, customer loyalty. So you're looking at this as an efficiency and an effectiveness tool of, if you've got to micromanage your staff and you're looking for inconsistency, as in you're looking for customization and flexibility, it's a bad fit. So you want to make certain that your product's characteristics are informing the way in which you set up your continuum of empowerment. How much control must be exerted, how much involvement, engagement, and flexibility needs to be exerted. And lastly, CRM, Customer Relationship Management. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the knowledge management discipline around this. This is a very big info systems thing at the moment. And that is basically when you are a services marketing organization, you have boundary spanners. Boundary spanners engaging customers. You have a choice. You can capture that knowledge within the individual or you can capture that knowledge within the firm. If you are confident you're going to retain the individual, then you don't, you can skip the CRM and the CRM infrastructure. If however, you want to create the opportunity to 
capture the knowledge, you'll need to set up uh, a whole bunch of information systems, uh, knowledge management, knowledge capture, even down to things of setting up a database where all contacts with the customer are logged and registered. Now, a bit later in the chapters, there's a discussion around service culture. And this is important that if you're going to set up a CRM, it's got to be supported by the culture of the organization who, and the correlation between effort, impact and reward. Your staff need to see that there is a value to filling out the relationship management system. They need to see that there is a connection between when they exert time to add details to this database, that that is rewarded because your firm needs to know this, but the people who are finding out the information are constantly punished for time spent doing the job you've asked of them, or they feel that there is no reward or value, then that is detrimental to running your CRM. So CRM is a big thing. It's its own standalone subject area. Uh, there's a lot of research done around it, but at the end of the day, it comes down to capture of knowledge from frontline staff into the organization. What is the process and protocol you want to take? And it will vary by service type, staff type, and whatever the contemporary technology looks like.